This morning's reading starts from Mark chapter 2, verse 23. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some ears of corn. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abithar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked round at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to them, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Thanks be to God. Well, what a story, what stories. Right from the start, from the opening page of Mark's Gospel, there's a fast-moving feel about it. In the first page, Jesus is baptised by John the Baptist, filled with the Spirit, affirmed by his Father, Round about page two, Jesus has made a stand, first of all, against the devil, called Satan, by Mark. Right after that, he's made a stand against the devil's work in the healing of a man with an unclean spirit. On the same occasion, he's established himself as an authority on God's word. He taught with authority, they said about him. And then he's established a healing ministry. More than that, he's declared his desire to heal all those who come to him. That's quite a start, do you think? Quite a start. And at first, it seems, of course, that everything's going swimmingly. But then we see the opposition. Look, they say, when Jesus forgives as part of healing a paralyzed man, only God can forgive sin. Look, they say, he keeps company with bad people. Look, they say, his disciples don't fast. Poor theology is messing up the truth. And so it continues in the two stories we heard today. One about the disciples picking corn, can you believe? Oh, you're going to be very careful when you go from here this morning about what you pick. And then um, about this healing of a man. And I just want to say from the start, if you seriously follow Jesus, you can expect opposition. Maybe you don't want to hear that, but you will feel that if you stand by your Lord and Saviour, Jesus. So... um, Let's look at eating corn. Now, eating corn wasn't 
forbidden by the Pharisees on the Sabbath. What was forbidden was reaping. The disciples were reaping, right? Okay. It's an example of um, hedging around. The Pharisees had a system for avoiding breaking the law. They said, if the law says this, then we'll make sure we don't do any of that that's near it. So in that way, we can be sure we'll never break the law. They put a big margin round what they did. So the command says, no work on the Sabbath. That's important. The Pharisees said, okay, let's look at what could possibly de be described as work and we'll ban that as well. You see how it works. I always thought it was easy to define work and I'd never really looked into the commandment itself about the Sabbath. Um, so I thought, well, I'm preaching on this, let's have a look. Uh, what it actually says, well, it, what it says, what you're used to hearing, is six days shall you labour and do all your work. What it actually says, if you look at the meaning of the words, is six days, I want to get this right, six days shall you serve and carry out your occupation which is, I think, just a little bit different. More helpful, really, because whatever we do in our lives should be in the service of other people. And Jesus himself said he came to serve, didn't he? And to live his life as a sacrifice. And occupation is a more helpful word than work because um, actually I don't work anymore but I do have something that occupies my time. So six days shall you serve, even your employer if you've got one. Mm, I can see him grimaces going up there. Um, six days shall you serve and carry out your occupation. Sabbath is a word that's derived from the meaning to cease, to desist, to um, rest. The key thought on the Sabbath is to take a break. You'll do that, don't you? All the day? <laughs> You're so honest. I love that. I don't, I know. I creep things in. I, I'll just do that. And um, really, it's not something I need to do on the Sabbath. I need to focus on God and see what he's saying. Another thing about the Sabbath is that God's law applies to everyone, rich and poor. But also, I don't know if you noticed, it includes animals. Your animals are supposed to rest on the Sabbath. It's a blanket thing about resting. Amazing, really. After COVID, I don't know if you realise this, but a lot of people decided not to work. Seriously, they did. It's more unemployment now, not because there needs to be, that's quite genuine, but because people simply said, well, I don't really need to work, so I won't. Now, God's provision was for work, but it was also for rest. You should work for six days, but on the seventh, you're to rest. And when we don't do that, 
That's when things go wrong. The Pharisees, on the other hand, made sure that you couldn't carry your granddaughter on the Sabbath. Really, seriously. What's happening here is that the law, which was supposed to give rest once a week, is becoming a burden to people. The very opposite of its intention. God said, I want you to rest once a week and enjoy what I've made. Enjoy it with me. I don't know what the disciples felt when they were accused of working on the Sabbath. Jesus was not so accused because he didn't actually pick the ears of corn. But I'll tell you what, he stuck up for his disciples absolutely. He was the one that spoke. He was the one that said all these wonderful words pointing out how wrong they were. Jesus will always stick up for you when you're doing his work, honestly, or when you're just trusting in him. He will always stick up for you. Someone in um, my um, wider family lives near some Orthodox Jews who strictly keep the Sabbath. And they actually ask my family member to turn the lights off for them in the winter if it gets, sorry, turn the lights on for them if it gets dark in the winter towards the end of the day. That's not a criticism. It's better to go over the top with keeping the Sabbath than to slip up the other way. The thing is to take a right view. So, what does Jesus say? Firstly, he quotes a precedent about what happened in the past. Here the high priest at the time of, time of David had authorized David to eat the bread of the presence which was kept in the sanctuary and was allowed to be eaten only by the priests. Serious stuff, not a few ears of corn and he also shared it round to his mates. So at the very least, there's a serious question about this law that the Pharisees were talking about breaking. And there's a hint in it too, because the men were desperate for food. There's always a reason, and Jesus quickly saw that. But so that we don't have to think about exceptions, Jesus then gets to the very heart of the matter. The Sabbath was made for, I'll say man, but I'll say men and women. The Sabbath is made for people, not people for the Sabbath. When God finished his creation, he rested as an example to us all. I don't suppose he needed to rest, but he rested anyway. And we have that example. And um, you need to rest. Your employees need to rest. Your animals need to rest. That's, that's, that's a, I, get, I guess they're quite good at that anyway, aren't they? Yeah, we'll leave that one then. Okay. You get a free benefit every Sunday. Isn't that good? We went to um, Romania, Gina, me, recently, and um, we went around about Easter, their Easter as it happened, and um, we wanted to change some money, and you get a good exchange rate over there, so we saved up our money and took it with us and um, the exchange was shut the first day and it was shut the second day and that they were joining holidays together for Easter and it was shut for a week so I had to use my credit card which is not a good idea but 
it seems the Romanians like holidays. And, um, well, whether that's right or not, I don't know, but we were forced to rest from spending. But seriously, final thing on this, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. If the purpose of Sunday is yours and my spiritual and physical recreation, recreation, then Jesus has the right as God's mouthpiece to say what the Sabbath is really for. Is the Lord rest? Is he Lord of my rest day? Let's just take a moment, maybe a minute, for you to ask that same question. Am I, are you, making the right use of the Sabbath? Just a little pause. And then let's look at the man with the shriveled hand. The opposition are watching now. Will he heal on the Sabbath? Because healing is included in the Pharisees' list of things you're not supposed to do. It's work, you see, healing. Jean and I knew a lady with a withered right hand. She found it very difficult to do things that you and I take for granted. She um, wanted to turn the mattress one day and she couldn't. It was too heavy for her to do. So she said in her quaint way, Lord, I need a man. She was a single lady, by the way, about, about 80 years old. I need a man. So she um, had just got up. She drew the curtains back, and there were two window cleaners cleaning the windows. There you are, God of provision, two men. And they helped her in the course of time to turn the mattress. But here, the theology has become skewed in the same way that you've already seen. The rule that excluded healing from the Sabbath put the wrong emphasis on it. There's nothing better than life and wholeness. And it's the very thing we should be doing on a Sabbath is giving life and wholeness. And Jesus immediately, of course, pointed that out to them. The whole emphasis of the Sabbath, of all days, should be to save life and not to destroy it. And we can get in this position as a church, actually. We get scared of healing. We get scared of what we call um, deliverance, which is getting rid of demons. Methodism now has a rule that only those who are qualified can pray for deliverance. So what if 
there's somebody here this morning who's been anointed by the Lord Jesus for that very purpose. There's a problem, isn't there? Who are we to argue with God? Of course, there should be rules in place for things like that. Seriously, we should be very careful about who we um, authorize to do such things, but we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we have a fear of abuse, the right answer is to do the job properly. And we can get in this position for other reasons too. We can say things like, God may not heal, so I won't ask. I don't want people to be disappointed if healing doesn't happen. I can mince my words when praying, fearing that God may not heal and not wanting the person to be disappointed. And so I hedge my prayer around with expressions like, if it's your will, Lord. Well, of course, we should always make sure that we are acting and asking in God's will, but don't let's build hedges that aren't meant to be there. If you believe that you're praying for something Jesus wants to see, then pray it. Pray it clearly so the person that's being prayed for can hear you. No ifs, no buts. And if you've made a mistake, which is sometimes a possibility, do you think Jesus is going to mind? Do you think you've got to, will you get told off by Jesus for making a mistake? Will you? Will you? No, of course not. We're in safe hands. We sang it, didn't we? He's a saviour. I knew a man who was um, superintendent of Methodist Central Hall in Westminster. Um, we spent some time with him, Gene and I, and um, he said something which I've always remembered. He said, his name was Malcolm White. He said this, when I pray, some people are healed immediately. Some people are healed the next day or in a few days' time. <coughs> Nobody is hurt. Everybody is blessed. We need to finish. There are some scary things in this story. Jesus looked around at them and he was distressed at their hard hearts, the pharisaical hard hearts. Distressed. I don't want to distress Jesus, do you? I wouldn't want to do that by having a hard heart or not wanting to do something that he wants. So here's what he does. It's called action and cooperation. Stand up, he says, stand up. To the man with a with that hand. No, not you, it's okay. <coughs> stand up, stand up. It, He's already cooperating with Jesus, isn't he? He's already, he's already taking action. He's already getting himself in a position where Jesus can do something. Stand up. He stands up in front of the whole congregation. Can you imagine that? And stretch out your hand. And it's restored, just like the other one. Healing involves an action on our part, responding to Jesus, cooperating with his healing. It reminds me of a story of Peter who um, didn't want to go fishing any more than he had, who was fed up with the fact that there were no fish in the net. And because Jesus said, 
put your net on the other side. He said, Lord, because you say so, I'll do it, because you say so. And I think that's what that man did that day. I think he said, because Jesus says, stretch out your hand, there's an element of faith, because it was Jesus and he believed. And what did the Pharisees do? They went out and plotted with the Herodians how they could kill Jesus. And I want to pray this morning, and I'm sure you're going to join with me, that we do not kill the healing ministry of Jesus by letting things stand in the way of it.